welcome Professor Karen Alter to Duke Law. Uh, Karen is a longstanding friend and colleague, uh, and I thought I would introduce her by just saying a few remarks to kind of give my perspective about how the world has changed in terms of international courts from when I was studying these issues uh, in law school. So if you go back 25 years or so to the late 80s, early 90s, there were very few international courts that permeated into the US legal consciousness. Um, there were two courts in Europe that were doing things that people thought were kind of interesting, but they were over there in Europe. And they weren't making all that much of, of, a, of a dent in terms of legal thinking here. There was the International Court of Justice, but that had become quite politicized, as some of you may know, following the 1984 um, uh, US Nicaragua case involving uh, paramilitary activities in, in Nicaragua and the US's withdrawal from the jurisdiction of the court. So if you were to think about international courts 25 years ago, you would have, it would have been a really short course, I think it's fair to say. Um, and it might not have been all that interesting um, from a US perspective. 25 years on, boy, the world has really changed. We have, and you'll get all the facts and figures, but roughly two dozen uh, courts and tribunals in different parts of the world, in different uh, subject areas with different degrees of activity and uh, having a variety of different relationships with litigants, interest groups, government officials, and so forth. And, and the real big question here, and this is the one I think that Professor Alter uh, tackles better than anyone, is how have these courts shaped law and, in poli law and politics within their respective, the countries over which they exercise jurisdiction uh, internationally? What are they doing? How are they actually making a difference if they are making a difference? Right? I don't want to say they necessarily are, uh, but if they are, how are they doing it, and, and where are they doing it, and what explains that? Uh, and as I said, I really think that Professor Alter's approach to this, she spent a decade or more thinking about first about the European Court of Justice, and then about other international courts and tribunals, her approach, which really does blend the best of, I think, legal analysis and social science, gives the definitive big picture, and her new book, uh, the new terrain of international law really does cover that landscape. And after the uh, lecture, there will be copies of the book on sale, and you can even get an author-signed copy if you are so inclined. And I'll just uh, conclude by saying that I, I've been privileged to work with uh, Professor Alter on a variety of these projects uh, over the last, oh, I guess six to eight years or so. Uh, we managed to find interesting courts to study in different parts of the world uh, and to learn about a variety of new things. And I have to say, my own uh, scholarship has been uh, really enriched by having the opportunity to work with her and learn from her. And so I'm really delighted that all of you today can learn from her as well. So please join me in welcoming, wel welcoming Professor Karen Alter. Thanks, Larry. It's really nice to be back here because I presented to a seminar um, two of the chapters when I was really trying to just work out the framework. And Professor Helfer was one of my strongest critics on the on the framework, which you won't see that much uh, presented here today. Um, but it's really nice to be back. I was really like coming here. So uh, this is the book that I just finished, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. So what is new when I call it the new terrain of international law? Well, one thing is new is these new style courts. And they're coupled with deeply encroaching, often embedded international law. Another thing that's new is the politics. Because we have these courts, and the big question that kind of animates my research is, if the problem with this international law is it's not enforceable, how does the politics of international law change if it becomes enforceable? And the way it changes is the um, uneven judicialization of international relations. So that's new. It's a having These courts are having an effect on politics. And then rights are also new, because these international courts create legal remedies for violations of the law. So when I talk about the new terrain of international law, this is what I mean as being new, and you'll see more of what I'm talking about as we go on. I have about four goals in this book. One is to make comprehensible this growing architecture of the international judiciary, and I'll show you a number of ways in which I do that. It's really an alphabet soup of acronyms. And so it's a, like a laundry list of all of these letters. So what are other ways in which you can get your hands around what this universe of international courts is about? 
This four rule framework, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about, is a way of broadening how we think about what international courts are doing. They're not just dispute settlement bodies for disputes between governments. They're doing administrative review, they're doing constitutional review, and so the four rule framework broadens how we think about what international courts do. But really what I want to do is move the debate from if international courts are having an influence to how and when are international courts having an influence. And so I hope with this book to raise the floor of theorizing about international courts and to kind of move on and skip the debate about uh, if. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about courts, politics, and rights, the trends of delegating authority to international courts, the how and when question, the central argument of the book, and then give you three examples of international courts and actions where we start to get to the rights part of the book. So let me start with courts. These are some of the visualizations from the handbook on international adjudication we put out where they took my data and made it look a lot prettier. Um, and this shows you courts in Europe and the countries that fall under their jurisdiction and in Africa. So in some ways it's a confusing mess, but they're all in, in, in the service of trying to have you see what this architecture is about. I'm talking about international courts. And I'm using the definition by the Project of International Courts and Tribunals, a permanent institution composed of independent judges that adjudicate disputes between two or more entities, one of which can be a state or an international organization, that work on the basis of predetermined rules and procedures, and that issue decisions that are binding. Again, it's not my definition. This is the definition from PICT. What I like about this definition is that you're looking at a, a like set of cases. Some of these courts can also issue advisory opinions, but I don't look at the advisory opinions. I look at um, decisions that are binding, which also means that these courts are enforcing hard law. And so for social scientists, we like a like universe of cases. That being said, the most arbitrary part of this definition is this permanent courts part. And everything I'm going to tell you today does not pertain just to permanent courts. Uh, by Focusing on permanent courts, I can limit my universe to a more manageable 24 international courts, which is barely manageable for me. Um, but you'll see in what I talk about today, I look at courts that are not permanent. So I don't think there's a lot, theoretically, that you should put any, any weight on this permanence, but it does limit my universe. So by that definition of international courts, as Professor Helfer was saying, the number has increased. In 1980, there were five. In 2000, there were 16. In 2006, there were at least 24 operational courts. There's actually more treaties that are drafted for international courts. There's about 30. But by operational, I mean there are judges appointed, and you could bring a case today to these 24 international courts. But since I'm really interested in the judicialization of politics, and I don't care that much about permanence, um, you would also want to include the 62 ad hoc and quasi-judicial international legal bodies, many of which can issue binding interpretations, many of which meet every element of the definition except that they're not permanent. And then there's also domestic enforcement of international law. So when I focus on international courts, I'm focusing on just the tip of the iceberg of what is a much deeper structure of judicializing international relations by making international law enforceable. Not only are there more international courts, international courts today are fundamentally different than what used to be the paradigmatic example in us old people's heads, the International Court of Justice, which had optional jurisdiction and only states could initiate litigation. And I give the label old style courts to those courts. And for old style courts, the design features mean that governments control which cases can be litigated. They can opt into the court's jurisdiction. They can block a case from proceeding. They can choose not to bring a case. They can settle it diplomatically. It gives governments a lot more control over what disputes are actually litigated. The new style courts then have compulsory jurisdiction, and non-state actors can also initiate litigation. What this means is that a broader range of actors are triggering international adjudication, so questions that would never before have gotten in front of international courts are today getting in front of international courts. And governments are, can't stop these cases from bubbling up. They can try to deal with them once they're there, but they can't block them at the gatekeeping level. So you have more courts and more courts today uh, than in the past are new style courts. So here's a question for you. I have 24 international courts. How many do you think are old style versus new style? Anyone have a guess? No one's going to wager a guess of 24? It's got to be some combination. Yes. Eight are new style or 12 and 12? Actually, four, and I have to break these down because they're not necessarily the same, four. Four have optional jurisdiction, and four only allow states to initiate litigation. 
21 have compulsory jurisdiction and 20 allow non-state actors, commissions, individuals to initiate litigation. So many more courts today are new style international courts, which is why there's a lot more international litigation, which I'm going to show you in a minute. But what this means is that governments and national judges start to lose their monopoly control over saying what international law means. So it's a real challenge to who controls what international law means. It's no longer national judges exclusively. It's no longer governments exclusively. You have a more crowded set of actors that include international courts. Just a little more description about these courts and the subject matter. 16 have an economic jurisdiction. Five or maybe six have human rights. The European Europeans like to get Think of the European Court, of human, uh, European Court of Justice as a human rights court. I don't think that really applies, but that would be the six. Um, three of them in my universe have criminal jurisdiction. Nine have general jurisdiction. This is more than 24, because a number of these courts allow states to bring any dispute that they want to the court to hear. Regionally, four of them have a global reach, the WTO, the International Criminal Court, the ICJ, and the Law of the Sea Tribunal, but most of them are regional, six in Europe, five in Latin America, nine in Africa. And since I focus on operational courts, that's my universe right there. But Asia has one non-operational dispute settlement body. And the Middle East actually has one barely operational investment court um, that does have judges, so it meets the definition, but it barely does anything. So you can see that there's these geographic holes Asia and the Middle East, um, which is an interesting question to ponder. So in many different ways, I try to help people get their hands around this. And so this is from the handbook, the set of visualizations. Also, I'm affiliated with a center in Denmark, iCourts. And they have, this is the beta version. They really have to update it. But this map that you could go to, and then you can click on it. And this is actually the data from my book. You can see and access more information about the courts. And then I have all this on a web page for the book. So you could download the visualizations. You can look at my coding by role. And um, you can get the Excel sheets in which it's there. So a lot of ways in which people then can study and broaden what the universe of international courts. I said that usage is up. These are the two courts that Professor Helfer first talked about, the European courts that you would look at. And a couple of things I want you to pay attention in to. This line is going to correspond to the next table picture that I'll show you. But look how long it took for these courts to become active. So the European Court of Justice was 152, but got jurisdiction over the common market in 58. And it's relatively more cases, really picking up in the 80s. Um, rights, which started in 58, really only starts hearing cases in the 90s. And then it, it starts to explode when membership in the Council of Europe expands and when individuals gain direct access to the court. But it took a really long time for these courts to be doing anything. And most of the international courts that are part of this 24 are just down in this period of time. Okay, So they're doing more, um, but they're very, very operational. So let me show you the other courts that are do not include this in it. And this is 400 cases per year. These are the other international courts. This line is mostly non-citizens who are in the United States up until 1989. So every year for the last 40 years. I still have many people that come to me and ask me about that. So I have a, a national court, the Benelux court, the WTO, the GATT. And then it starts yearly. So before the end of the Cold War, you had 256 rulings, binding rulings from all non-European international courts combined. It's a little fudge because Benelux is European. And then we go yearly, and you can start to see how litigation takes off. Um, it looks like it's decreasing at the end, but that's really um, an artifact of OHADA, which had a lot of cases but was based in the Ivory Coast, and the Civil War went on, and they had to shut down for the duration of the Civil War. So that'll pick up again. And the Andean Doctrine is also picking up again. You can tell from the width of the courts how many cases that they're hearing. Now, I don't take litigation as a sign of effectiveness. But to me, this tells me where I want to look. And this is why I started to study the Andean Court of Justice. Because I think that lawyers don't waste their time. And if they're going to be bringing cases, it must mean that they think that there's some legal value to bringing cases. And so a court that has no cases is not going to have any influence. A court that has a lot of cases may have influence, and that's the light you want to look under to start to research how these courts matter. So by compiling this data, it led me to start studying courts that I had never heard of because there are a lot of cases and I wanted to figure out what was going on. Okay, so what is new? There's more in their new style international courts. 
I'm going to tell you a little bit more about a broader range of judicial roles that are being delegated. These are not just interstate dispute settlement bodies. International courts are increasingly activated. But let me just tell you for a second about embedded law, because the nature of the law that these courts are applying is different than it was in the old days. Um, and this difference matters for my argument, because it facilitates a legal uh, dialogue over what the law means between domestic judges and international judges. So embedded law is not the same thing as ratified treaties. It's a little bit more. It includes directly applicable community law, uh, human rights law that might be part of national constitutions, criminal law changes that are part of the Rome Statute uh, that were adopted as part of adopting the Rome Statute, changes required by the Torture Convention, global security laws, all of these international legal initiatives that require you to actually change your domestic legal system. And the legal system change is inspired by the international level, and it's tied to the international level. It looks like domestic law, but it's the exact same law, essentially, that the international judge is interpreting. And that opens the door for domestic and international judges to be talking, and, and administrators to be talking about substantively the same set of rules. So that's also what is new. OK, so that's the global landscape that starts the analysis. And then I want to know how politics changes, because we have these international courts. What exactly is delegated international courts is actually very, very little. I say international courts have the power to issue binding rulings in the cases that are adjudicated. That's all they have been tasked to do. That really is all that any court has been tasked to do. That's really all the US Supreme Court does, too. They get cases, they issue a ruling that is binding um, for the cases that are adjudicated. In a, in a common law system, we might think it has precedential value. And so there's a little bit of a difference there. But it's not a lot of power. So I want to figure out how that very limited power translates into something meaningful, if that's all the power that you have. And I call this the alter politics framework, is the name that I ended up giving to it, after every other name I gave it was shot down. So what I say is that international courts alter politics by giving symbolic, legal, and political resources to compliance constituencies, which are ever-changing groups of actors who, for a variety of reasons, prefer policies that cohere with international law. Let me tell you what that means. Okay. Okay, so I want to think about who then orchestrates compliance. And I break this down into compliance partners. And those are the set of actors who already have the power to follow international rules. They don't have to get a new legislation. They don't have to get a new statute. Simply by changing their decision and the way they think about legal obligations, they can comply with international law. And then there are compliance supporters who don't have the power on their own. They're going to have to mobilize some kind of political strategy that is going to pressure governments, judges, administrators, the military, or maybe legislatures to pass new laws. So the compliance supporters are the larger group of supporters who pressure this set of actors towards compliance. And together, they're the compliance constituency. So another way to think about who this compliance constituency is, is it includes true believers in the rule of law, true believers in the substance of law, human rights advocates, economic firms, um, those who are, are, are um, pursuing mass atrocities, people with a particular interest in stake, lawyers who are looking for cases, those who just want a basis to criticize what the government is doing, legal actors who think that the, that is a matter of law, the court is correct in its interpretation, and individuals who believe in the multilateral system overall, who believe in the UN, believe in the WTO, believe in, in a, a human rights regime. For me, as a political scientist, one of the interesting things about this is two of these groups are legal groups. They're part of the political politics because they care about the law. And for them, it's a matter of legal politics. I won't call it lawfare. I'm not a big fan of that term. But they're, they're engaging in this, and, and they're being part of the compliance constituency because they care about the law. So this is a real change in international relations that you've mobilized this whole broader group that includes lawyers, of which there are not only many, but they're in every country in the world. Um, and many of them have been educated in the United States and Europe. And I wouldn't go so far as to say they're an epistemic community, but they are a group of people who have a shared way of looking at politics that you can mobilize because what we're talking about is international law and international courts. So you think, well, these compliance constituents are there. Now we add in international courts. What do we get that now you add in international courts? Because the compliance constituencies have always been there. You get things just by the fact that the court exists. 
you get the possibility of a remedy, which may mobilize a legal actor to claim this remedy, to raise a suit, to compile a suit. And the fact that this body is external to the domestic system means that it can escape some of the domestic um, pressures. If, if a domestic judiciary is politically captured, think of maybe Venezuela, where pretty much every judge has been replaced by pro-Chavez forces, you're not going to get an, an unusual decision from the Venezuelan judiciary. But these international courts are outside of the state. The Venezuelan government does not control it. So you will get a different kind of decision. That's what you get just by them existing. And the fact that you might get something different might be a reason why you want to raise a case. But of course, I care more about what they actually do, what ICs contribute. So international courts can name a violation of the law. They can take a policy that the government was saying is absolutely compliant with international law. If you want to think of Putin saying his annexation of the Crimea is compliant, and the court can, if they get the case, say, no, that is not compliant. So they've named the violation of the law. They provide an authoritative legal interpretation. What would it take for a referendum to be compliant with international law? And they can specify the remedies that other actors will then coalesce around. They'll say, this is what we want because we want law compliance. And the court has named what law compliance entails. So that's the angentic contribution of the international court. Another way to look then at the power of international courts is they have an international legal authority by virtue of their formal mandate. They have the power to name violations of international law by virtue of the cases that are presented. They use the currency of legality. They mobilize supporters of the rule of law. They mobilize supporters of legal analysis. And they have a conversation about what law means and whether a certain behavior is legal or illegal. And they have a legal authority that is external and beyond the control of the targeted states. That's their power. But of course, I care about when does this power become meaningful. So when I look and practice at these different national, international courts, what I find is politically powerful international courts have a very clear legal mandate. They have very clear binding legal rules to enforce, and these legal rules have few legal loopholes. They have domestic compliance partners with political power, and they can, if necessary, draw on domestic and international support to protect the judges and to add this political leverage pressure on the compliance partners. The irrelevant international courts then, those who have no cases, have either a very narrow subject matter or very limited access, which means that there's few cases and few ways to connect with compliance partners. They have very vague legal rules that are full of loopholes, so there's hard to make a legal argument that a government's not following the law. There's maybe no legal mobilization, so there are no cases. And there's non-existent or politically weak compliance partners, those who will not stand up to the government and tell them that they're violating the law. I think just as interesting is what is not part of this list. So I'll get to that in a minute. The social science answer then to this one question would be to look at these four steps and what causes variation in the opportunity structure of litigation, which cases can be raised and which cannot, in the existence of legal mobilizations, this is what law and society scholars spend a lot of time studying, in the court's willingness to be a change agent, and in the available compliance policy partners and the interests of these different actors. And what you see from this is that really the only thing that the courts control, if they control it at all, is number three. So much of whether or not a court has influence is exogenous to anything the court might do, which is why we see tremendous variation in when international courts become politically uh, relevant. So as a social scientist, then you would want to develop a bunch of hypotheses around these different structures. But what's not then a necessary condition for international court power? Well, one would be explicit government support. So for those who believe that courts only have influence when they're doing exactly what the government wants, my argument is saying no. If you can get the support of the compliance partners, they can put pressure on the government, and governments can be led to do things that they wouldn't have otherwise done. Also, it's not a function of how much coercive power that stands behind the court. And you don't need a world government. When I say these are not necessary conditions, I'm saying the system can work without these conditions. I'm not saying that having political support of hegemonic people and lots of money and course of power doesn't help, because it does. It is relevant. I'm just saying that, that that's not what these international courts rely on, because they only have the power to issue binding rulings in the cases that are adjudicated. And when you look at variation in their influence, it doesn't come down to a correlation between government support or coercive power, and certainly not a world government, because we don't have that, and I, I wouldn't want that anyway. So I, I'm going to tell you in a minute about four different versions of how international courts alter politics. That's what I then do with this framework. Um, and I'm going to tell you about these rules. 
The point of the rules is to say that most of what international courts do is not controversial. That the design matters, but maybe not in the ways you, you thought they did. And they allow me then to not break this down into a conversation of economic courts versus human rights courts versus criminal courts. I, I put them all down under different roles. And I show in the book that the international courts can work in these four different roles, even in developing country contexts where the rule of law is not as um, stable and where international law, therefore, is not this, I call it a luxury good, this extra law that you already have your domestic system that you like just fine, thank you, who needs international law? In the, in the developing world, they don't have domestic systems that work so well, and they really want international law as an alternative, not everywhere, but often as an alternative to the domestic system. Let me tell you a little bit about the rights of the courts in action and then open this up for questions. So what I say is judicialization occurs where citizens, organizations, and firms see laws conferring upon them rights and where politicians conceive of their policy and legislative options as bounded by what is legally allowed. Political science speak, this means it's a constructivist argument and that it's really the intersubjective beliefs of the litigants who think that they have legal rights and the governments and judges who acknowledge that actually they do have legal rights. And once you have those conditions, then you're having a conversation about what are these legal rights. And that's the condition under which the politics will be judicialized. So I go through these four roles. I talk about dispute settlement, which is really about helping the litigants solve their disagreements. And the main compliance partners then are litigants. And this is the old train of international law. This is what a lot of the initial uh, legal scholarship has been focused on. This is what Posner likes to focus on. And I have these four case studies that I look at it. And I have a chapter on administrative review, where it's private actors that are contesting the legality of administrative decisions. All of these systems have compulsory jurisdictions. All allow direct private access. And the key compliance partners are the administrative actors. And I have four cases that I look at, at these as well, including non-permanent courts like NAFTA and ICSID. I have constitutional review cases, which are holding legislative actors accountable to higher order law. And key compliance partners become national supreme courts, and I have an argument about that. And I have case studies that involve international courts reviewing the constitutionality of international legal decisions, legal actions and rules, and reviewing state actions and rules. I'm going to tell you about the enforcement cases, which are naming violations and defining remedies. And here the compliance partners can vary the most, and I'm going to tell you about the three in blue. Okay, so this is Hadi Jatumani who was sold for $400 when she was 12 years old. And in 1999, um, Niger got a new constitution which banned slavery. And in 2003, there were new domestic laws passed that criminalized slavery so that the owners of slaves could then be liable to prosecution. Anti-Slavery International, working through a local association called Timidria, hired local judges to go around to marketplaces and to tell citizens about these new laws and to tell slave owners that it was now illegal to prosecute, uh, to have slaves, and that they could face these very lengthy prison terms. And in conjunction of going around and speaking at these marketplaces, someone came up and told a local judge that he knew someone who had a lot of slaves and treated them very badly. And then the local judge met with the mayor and met with this man and pressured him to issue a liberation certificate to acknowledge that slavery was now illegal and to liberate Hadijatu Mani through this certificate. But after he liberated her, he started to have second thoughts. The judge went away, the mayor, uh, the mayor stopped pressuring him, and he said, no, actually, I want her uh, back. I kind of like her. I've had kids with her. And so they transferred their fight to family law, and the, the former master made the argument that as soon as she was lib liberated, she became his de facto wife. And so, no, she's not a slave anymore. Yes, she was a slave, but now she's my wife. So they, there's a series of domestic cases in which the master keeps winning these cases. And she ends up in jail for bigamy. She's been liberated. She takes up with another man who she wants to marry. The husband <coughs> charges her with bigamy. She's pregnant with this man. And Hadija Tumani and her brother, who consented to the marriage, end up in jail for bigamy. And this is when Inner Rights enters the scene, a, a London-based NGO. And they start to look at this case and to raise an ECOWAS-level case, the argument being that the, the Niger's legal system has denied the slavery and has not given her a remedy all along. In the politics of this, Hadi Jatumani is released from jail for bigamy. Um, and the ECOWAS case is a change of venue and moves to the capital of Niger for adjudication. 
It then gets to the Echo Wasp Court, which in a very small nutshell basically says that um, you cannot obscure slavery in family law. You can't just shift it and say she's now the wife, and that she is still entrapped in a system of slavery. This is a ruling that has huge implications for family law and for marriage without consent. But they, they don't go down the path of these huge implications. They instead say she's uh, she, the government failed her in its legal system, and the government's responsible to give her an award which amounts to $20,000 in the US. The Minister of Justice is in the audience when this ruling is announced. He stands up and he says, we will comply with this decision. And in three months, they've complied. The bigamy charges are dropped. She gets her money. And then they're in full compliance. So it's, they've turned to what's a very hard issue and made it something very concrete. OK, you pay her $20,000, you're in compliance with the law now. She was then later given this award. And I put this picture up there to show it's not that power is not operating in this. Power is obviously operating in this story in a number of ways, and the case study goes into it more. Um, but she, she couldn't have gotten this outcome if she had to rely on the domestic system alone. This is another case. This is about pulmonary arterial hypertension and the medication that deals with it, which is solidinophil citrate, which has another name that you know more commonly called Viagra. Okay, And this medication was a heart medication. They found out its second use based on the fact that men did not want to return the, the medication um, that were part of this, this test. The problem for Pfizer is that this medication was already in a generic form in Latin America. It was legally in a generic form in, uh, in Latin America. And under Andean law, you cannot issue a second use patent for a new use if, the, if there's nothing different about the medication. So the pills look exactly the same, and they can be legally sold. Pfizer tries to get a second use patent. It's illegal under Andean law. He's denied the patent. But then he manages to get Fujimori's government to issue a special decree that allows second use patents. And based on this decree, of which there's a big suggestion of money behind it, the agency issues second use patents. And Pfizer then floods the domestic courts in Peru and in a few other countries with suits against generic producers. And then generic producers are afraid to sell their medication on the market. The generic producers then go, their association goes to the Andean Secretariat and says, we want to bring Peru to the Andean court for noncompliance with Andean law. The Andean, it gets to the Andean court, and the Andean court says second use patents are not allowed on an, under Andean law. Therefore, Pfizer's new domestically issued patents are invalid. Therefore, all of the cases in the domestic legal system go away. And what happens in the end is that Indicopia, which is the agency charged with enforcing patents, rescinds the patent law. So the Peruvian law never changes, but Indicopia rescinds the patents. So therefore, there are no patents that Pfizer can defend in domestic courts, and all of these suits go away. Away. One more story I'm going to tell you. This is Charles Taylor, the warlord, and Charles Taylor, president of Liberia. In 2000, a special court of Sierra Leone was created. Most of um, Taylor's crimes were in Liberia, but he also supported forces in Sierra Leone. And the special court of Sierra Leone was created under the UN Charter, and it had the jurisdiction to go after heads of states, even heads of states in neighboring countries. In 2003, on the opening day of peace talks in Ghana, peace talks that were aimed at ending the Liberian Civil War, the Special Court of Sierra Leone issues an injunction against Charles Taylor. There's, they're very upset that this happens on the first day of peace talks. There's a sense that, that um, Ghan, the Ghana government was not notified. Uh, the American government was not notified. Everybody was very upset that David Crane had issued this, this um, indictment. But because this indictment is now there, Certain bargains are off the table. One of the things that's off the table is this idea that you could promise Taylor amnesty. Because you can't promise him amnesty from the Sierra Leone court. You can promise him amnesty within Liberia. And they do get an agreement that Liberia is going to use a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and there will be no prosecutions of his crimes. So he can't be uh, indicted anywhere in Liberia. But you can't promise him amnesty from the Sierra Leone court. So they work out a political deal where the Nigerian president offers Taylor asylum. And don't put this all on the Nigerian president, because this was a brokered deal by the United States and Britain. Everybody agreed to send him to Nigeria. And we didn't really know what was in this deal. We still don't know exactly what's in this deal. But you can see from what happened somewhat what's in this deal. So he is sitting there, uh, Taylor's sitting there with his three houses in asylum in Nigeria. 
And Ellen Sirleaf Johnson gets elected to the Liberian government. And then the United States decides that actually they would like to see Charles Taylor turned over to the special court. So what we then learn is what the political deal was that he would never be prosecuted in Liberia, but as soon as the Liberian government asked for his return, then his asylum would be rescinded by the Nigerian government who would send it uh, then him to Liberia, of which Sirleaf Johnson says, I do not want him in Liberia. And in fact, after he disappears for 24 hours, he's put on a UN plane, he's sent to Sierra Leone and immediately sent off to The Hague so they can get him out of there. Um, and what he, he's then indicted, and he's now in prison, um, serving a life term in, in Britain. Uh, I should say what Nigeria got for having rescinded the amnesty offer is a White House visit. That's all the US government promised him and gave him for this part of that deal. OK, so these three stories of international course altering politics. Some features I want to draw your attention to is who litigated. In all three of these cases, it was non-state actors who litigated the cases. They would not have been raised if you had to rely on governments to raise the case. The international court's contribution was to name the violation and to specify the remedy that then followed. And who complied varied. Niger's government complied. They paid Hadijatu Mani the money. Indicopi complied. It rescinded the patents. Nigeria complied by rescinding asylum. And the US Congress's a more complicated story of a whole bunch of actors making efforts to get Taylor turned over to the court. What compliance entailed was paying a fine, ignoring an illegal patent law, or the illegal Peruvian decree, I should say, that allowed second use patents, turning over Taylor, and then changing statutes, which is also part of the criminal prosecution things. So the mechanics, the case studies show in much more detail the mechanics of how the international court being there has altered the politics. But it's not always a very clear-cut case, and I hope in the case studies, in the book, I didn't present them today, I really do present the complexities of the cases. So let me just tell you for a second about the Taylor case. It's certainly true that if there was no independent prosecutor, David Crane, Sir Charles Taylor never would have been indicted. Clearly, he never would have been indicted. If there was no special court of Sierra Leone, he never would have been prosecuted, because Liberia still can't prosecute him. And Taylor tried to make the case under the Erodia ruling of the International Court of Justice that no domestic court could prosecute him. And he lost on that legal argument, in part because the special court of Sierra Leone had an explicit mandate that allowed him to prosecute him. Also not, uh, so those are happy stories, you know, these international courts made a difference. But for 12 years, it looks like there's a special court of Sierra Leone and the biggest fish are not being prosecuted. In the end, Taylor is one of the biggest success cases of international criminal law, but nonetheless, the prosecution took too long, his worst crimes were omitted, and it was way too expensive. And the effort looks like too little too late and it looks very Western. So if this is a happy case scenario, it's not a completely happy case. So I want to have time for questions. It went a little longer. What I'm saying is that the new terrain of international law, increasingly international law, creates rules, rights, and duties that penetrate the surface of the state. And when you add to this change in the law, delegation to international courts, it means that governments start to lose their control over the meaning of international law domestically. That's what I wanted to say by way of presentation, but I'm really happy to take questions. Thank you, Karen. We'll open it up. There's a huge amount of, obviously, information material there. Um, I'll let you, once you get a moment. Yeah. Anybody want to open it up for discussion? Don't be afraid. I'm very nice. Raise? Yeah, please. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relative merits of domestic courts and international courts as places to enforce international law. Because it seems like the volume problem is, is pretty serious for international courts. and. I wonder if that makes you know, domestic courts more appealing. But if so, is there any way to reconcile the problem of divergent interpretations of international law if the domestic courts are going to be the primary enforcers? Domestic courts are going to be, that's a great question. Domestic courts are going to be the primary enforcers for many, many reasons. And the most successful international system, which does not exist at all, would have no cases because domestic judges would have applied domestic law in such a way that, uh, that, or international law, that there would be no violations of international law. The whole system is structured with the preference that domestic courts would enforce international law. And the whole reason why you get a case to an international court is because the domestic political and legal system is blocked. For some reason, you can't re raise the case domestically, or the domestic judges won't go along. 
Um, so these are backup systems for the domestic system. And the idea that you could bring a case to the international court would then be the way to coordinate interpretation a little bit more. Um, I mean, a small caveat is that I don't worry personally as much about the fragmentation of international law that a lot of international lawyers worry about. I do worry about the same case getting divergent interpretations, whether it's interpreted domestically or internationally. So I don't worry that the African Court of Human Rights might treat human rights differently than the European Court of Human Rights. That's not a problem for me. Um, but when you get this disjuncture between the domestic remedy and the international remedy, that opens up a room for divergence. As long as the domestic remedy is more attractive to litigants, notwithstanding that there's a violation of international law, the case is never going to make it to the international court. So that means there's a huge selection bias of the cases that make it to international courts. They're the cases where the litigant's unhappy, where the government has already refused to comply, and where there is no domestic remedy uh, available to them, which sets up a potentially antagonistic relationship Sometimes. In other times, it does not. Because if you go back to like the second use patent case, I don't think that Indicopi actually was upset at Fujimori. They knew that this, this decree was corrupt. And they preferred Andean law because the agencies had helped write the Andean law. So they were being circumvented through corruption by Fujimori's decree. But they didn't want to put their neck out and say that this decree was illegal. Because as a domestic legal matter, it was legal. And so what the international court gave them was a good reason to say, see, we have to tear up this decree. We have to ignore it. And so I think, in a, in a, especially in developing countries where judges are often unhappy, judges and administrators are unhappy at the politics and at the corruption, the international level is backup and it's safety that can help them. But when I talk about constitutional politics and constitutional review, that's when you really see the pivotal role that domestic judges say. Because if the politics of this is the currency of legality, did the government violate the law or not violate the law? If the domestic courts say the government did not violate the law and the international courts say the government did violate the law, then the government gets to say, well, I'm not violating the law. See, our Supreme Court said I'm not violating the law. And so that really weakens the, the authority of an international court. So that the challenge of international judges is to bring these two interpretations in alignment. Okay. Catalina. I was uh, wondering if you saw in your investigation that some remedies can be more easily complied by other countries or not. I was wondering maybe if um, developing countries is more difficult to comply, like monetary compensations, or that is different in developing countries and developing countries, or? I, I think there. I think remedies are really important, but I don't. I don't necessarily see it in the way that you do it. So one of the reasons why I put those three cases up there and said what actual remedy was involved. I think that's where you have the most room for judicial creativity and for politics to enter the scene. I think that the the Hadi Jatumani case in many ways is really brilliant because the implications of that case are revolutionary and huge, but the court converted it into a remedy that's not that much money. And really, most developing countries can pay that amount of money, especially if you don't have punitive damages and you do actual damages of very poor people. They can pay that money. Um, so I, I think that you have this sliding scale of what the court decides to ask. And certain remedies are much harder to give. So the fourth case in the enforcement chapter that I didn't tell you about is the WTO case that in, the remedy required Congress changing a tax law. I mean, how hard is it for the US Congress to change a tax law? It's virtually impossible. But the WTO's threat actually got Congress to change the tax law. It took a long time for the US to comply um, because it's just so hard to pay a tax, you know, to change the tax law. But to pay $20,000, that you can do immediately. So I think that there's a lot of politics around which remedies are, are chosen by judges and how difficult they are to um, comply with. But I don't think it breaks down on this developing country versus rich country line. Yes, Suzanne. Can you speak a little, you had said that institutional design matters, but maybe not in ways we expect. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, so thanks. It comes out in the role-based chapter. So I said of administrative review, 
I think those, numerically speaking, are the lion's share of cases that international courts actually deal with. For the courts that I've studied uh, and coded in depth the legal decisions, the Andean court, over 90 percent of their cases are administrative review cases. The European court, over 70 percent are administrative review cases. All of those cases have direct litigant access and compulsory jurisdiction. And so when you think about theories that think about independent controversial courts, those are the two design traits that they have, compulsory jurisdiction and private access. But overwhelmingly in those cases, the litigants lose. So what administrative review ends up being is a way for an unhappy firm to complain about their government and then to have this, and to say, I don't trust domestic courts, and have this international court review it and say the government, the administrator was doing things exactly right. Don't get mad at them. And, and this was why the court, international court was given administrative review jurisdiction. And if you talk to the various participants, they're often very happy with the system. They think that the system works pretty well. Even a really controversial system like NAFTA that people complain a lot about their administrative review of our decisions, the trade lawyers, what they think are controversial versus what politicians think are controversial are very, very different. And so it's not the fact of private access and the fact of compulsory jurisdiction that decides whether or not the role is really polemical. I think it comes down to what, what when governments lose and unhappy, that's a polemical case. It's not if the judge made a crazy interpretation. It's not the amount or size of the remedy. It's something different. And so the design matters. You wouldn't have administrative review unless you had private access and compulsory jurisdiction. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be controversial. Yes. Okay, have you okay. found a difference um, between uh, courts that maybe are more regional, have a more limited territorial scope and uh, subject matter scope, as opposed to courts that have broader territorial and subject matter jurisdiction? Uh, do do actors comply with their decisions differently? That's a great question. Um, well, by definition, the regional courts have limited geographic jurisdiction. Um, but I think that the main question has to do with the reach of the law, uh, which is, no, I don't find that they have a more limited reach. Like, if you think about human rights courts, which are always regional courts, I mean, human rights is basically the Constitution. It's just about everything. And by the time you go to Latin America, they actually have laws on socioeconomic rights that international courts can enforce, which you don't find as much going on in, in Europe and in the United States. So the content of the law is not necessarily related to whether or not it's a regional court or not. Um, I do think that regional courts feel less foreign. Uh, if you think about the reluctance to litigate in front of the International Court of Justice, maybe you have one judge from your country, maybe you have two or three judges from systems that feel familiar, and then you have all of these other judges. And who are all of these other judges? When it's a regionally based court, it can um, be closer to the sent sentiments of local actors. So I think it's much better to have regional human rights courts than it would be to have a world human rights courts, which is also why I don't worry if the way that African courts interpret African human rights is different than the way that European courts interpret European human rights. Um, I have a question. You talked a lot about compliance constituencies, and you laid out very well how, the, how that works. But in some of the work we've done, and, and you've done also separately, we see sometimes compliance opponents, right? We see, so it's it, the narrative that comes across here is one in which the courts are able to be used by the compliance supporters to mobilize the compliance partners and change the political structure. But it doesn't always work out that way. Right. So what can you, in sort of a big picture question, when does that kind of relationship kind of go awry such that you get stakeholders in the domestic system who are opposed to compliance mm -hmm. with international law as interpreted by the IC? Right. So you, you took it in the when direction, and I was thinking more of that. Take it in another direction. No, I'll, I'll go back to the when direction. But first, let me say the judicialization of politics is just that the, what they start fighting over, what law means, it changes the way that the fight takes place. It is about what law means, and then your strategy to counteract the court's decision is going to be different than it would have been. You don't just say, I don't like the ICJ and we should ignore it. You have to make some kind of legal argument about why you can ignore the ICJ. So in that sense, it's a fudgy answer to say, you know, politics is still judicialized. Then you ask, though, under what conditions do um, 
does this opposition become strong? And that's something that I'm working on with Professor Helfer, and we're trying to think about it. I don't know if one is going to be able to say something like systematic about it. So political scientists would want to say when you have a powerful domestic interest that loses, that's when you're going to have a controversial case. And sometimes, because sometimes actually powerful interests are happy to lose because then they can use that loss as a way to change the law or as a way to actually stick it to a competitor. So my husband was a... Um, he was a lobbyist for John Deere, and they helped write the Clean Air Act, parts of the Clean Air Act that John Deere tractors complied with and Caterpillar tractors did not comply with. And they were like, we're a champion of clean air. You know, so sometimes you can lose in a way that turns into a win. So I don't think it's going to be when the government loses, because sometimes governments are happy to lose. And in some of my cases, like the, the women in combat roles, the German government was really quite happy to lose. Uh, and it's not just that firms and powerful firms are going to lose, but some actor gets a, a stick in their wheel and gets really, really upset and tries to do something about it. And this is usually when the lawyers come in and they start to say, is this a fight worth having? Look at what other issues are related to this fight. Can't we work out a political solution that deals with what you're most concerned with and just let this go and not turn this into a big war against the international court? And almost always that's what happens. It doesn't turn into a big war. They find a political workaround. Um, and so I, I, I wary of the idea that you could do some like large end regression and find, you can always find some correlation, but find some kind of theory of which cases that you like. It's the government lost and is unhappy about it, or some very powerful actor close to the government lost and is unhappy about it. It's not always when they lose, but for some reason they're unhappy about it. True. Yes. And then really? Um, I'm glad uh, Professor Helper asked that question because, as, as you probably saw earlier this week, Texas executed another one of the 51 nationals from the ICJ's Avena case, and there was a lot of publicity about how, yet again, the U.S. ignores the, its international law obligations as articulated by the ICJ. Um, but I wanted to ask, first, do you have a, do you have a list of the 24 courts on your, on your PowerPoint? Um, on the PowerPoint? I mean, it's, it's, it's not, not in a, a very I'll, I'll easily seeable way. Okay. Yeah, um, I mean, there's tons of lists in the book. There's all kinds of tables and lists, including I, one overview them, list. Um, yeah. A lot. Thank you. Um, so the, the question that I'd like to ask is, with, the, with respect to the two groups, the um, I think you called them the collaborators and the supporters. The partners and the, the supporters. Right. Yes. So in what way, sort of related to this politicization question, um, in what ways does the work that you've done with this book illuminate when those two groups like or want to support the international court model versus when they want something more ad hoc. Mm, that's good. Mm. Like, um, you know, ad hoc arbitrations, whether it's state to state, uh, you know, boundary disputes, or whether it's, um, yeah. you know, secession disputes, or whether it's investment treaty disputes, um, or various other different models. Well, so the way you phrase that question, whether they want a court or not, at least the first time I interpreted it, is not actually usually like the way the question gets posed, because there already is a court, and the court is already there for other reasons, and they were never asked if they would want a court. And so it's more like this is the legal landscape. And then the question is, do you want to litigate in the international court or in the domestic court or in an ad hoc system? And it varies tremendously. Um, and one of the things I hope in this book is to paint a landscape so that you could ask those questions more systematically. So one case that's really interesting on that is the Central American Court of Justice, which has a number of cases. It has like 80 rulings now. Um, and they're almost always about parliamentarians trying to get special rights through the Central American system. The interesting thing is that Central American countries are starting to arbitrate a lot through the Permanent Court of Justice, so of arbitration. So they have chosen to not use this court, which has jurisdiction for interstate disputes. They've chosen not to use it. So for me, those are an empirical questions that one would then go and investigate. When Larry and I worked at the Andean system, what we found was that intellectual property was a new area of law. Domestic judges really didn't understand it. It was very, very complex, and so both the Litigators, the firms, the administrators, and the Andean officials all wanted the Andean bodies to deal with these cases. They were afraid that the domestic judges would screw them up. Um, so those are a couple of examples, and I think it really does vary. But it's not about the choice whether or not to create the court, which is usually really a separate decision, one that, that Suzanne Katzenstein has studied, one that I don't really get into in this book. 
question just about, and I mean, I know it's one that you wrestled with, which is, you know, what exactly is it that governments want when we think that international courts have a lot of, you know, power because they're changing outcomes from what mm -hmm. would be otherwise, we have to have some theory of what the government would have done. And, and so, and I think, you know, you've been very highly sympathetic to, you know, that governments sometimes want to lose, yeah. right? And so, but for the court, they might not have gone down that policy path because to some extent, mm -hmm. you know, the court might give you the political capital to yeah. reel yourself back in. And so, you know, how do we then, as social scientists, deal with that? So I was just thinking in your Indian case, even Fujimori might have been happy to screw Pfizer. I mean, unless he's making a lot of money over and over no, and over again. If yeah. it's a one-shot game, yeah. then this is great. I get the money and <laughs> then I get to, you know, lower drug prices in my country. So how exactly, you know, like when we then try and think about these causal relationships, how do we right. try and get to what governments really want? So, you know, I use the case study approach to be able to kind of sort through. In a number of those case studies I talk, it's very clear that the government supported it. I don't think the narrative you give for the second use patent is necessarily the, the narrative I would give, and this gets at your question. So Fujimori actually never got the money. It was his lower level official that went to the United States and made a deal. If Fujimori was involved at all, it was because he was happy that the U.S. was happy and off his back. Okay, and, and the political hack who then pocketed the money, nobody particularly liked, and this person left office. And so I think he, he got, he, he, he wasn't really committed to Pfizer, he wasn't really committed to this law, and the U.S. then also backed off on second use patent negotiations, so maybe they got something. The way, though, that I would think about it is that Fujimori, by the end of his regime, was governing through corruption. He's not really paying the supporters enough. He's tolerating corruption at a very big scale by his lower level officials, which is finally why the Peruvians got fed up with him. And so his political structure was based on corruption. Does he want someone to come in and say you're corrupt? No. Does he want the flow of corruption to be disrupted? No. But this case didn't do that. They managed to never talk about corruption. So I think that there are ways you can find your way around and a savvy legal actors will do that. Um, so I don't have a, a general, you know, a, um, I, I show the complexity of the government preferences and it's an iterated game. So when the government loses and is unhappy about losing, of which they're not always unhappy, they then search for a workaround. The workaround is only very rarely let's shoot the messenger, let's kill the court, because there's so much easier workarounds to do. So they find some other kind of workaround and then the politics gets changed. And we look at this in a, in a couple of cases, like data protection is one of the cases where you see what kind of workarounds they construct. And um, there are people who slice into this more systematically. So there are people who study territorial disputes and say, when do governments want territorial disputes adjudicated? And the book has two territorial disputes that I juxtapose. It has the Bahrain Qatar one, where the political leaders just finally wanted this solved, mainly because the generation that was enmeshed in, in the fight had died, and the younger generation wanted investment. And no foreign firms were going to invest unless they had legal certainty over who owned the territory. So this younger set of leaders came in and they wanted the dispute resolved. But another dispute I look in, at involves Russia and Japan and the Kuril Islands. And Japan would very much like to litigate this dispute. And Russia is absolutely fine having this dispute not litigated, so it never gets litigated. But people have learned, looked systematically about the when do economic incentives to resolve territorial disputes arise. Like that would be the level that you'd have to ask the question. It's not, I don't think you're going to get traction by saying under what conditions do governments lose and they're unhappy. You would have to go at a more um, mid-level and try to look at the conditions that surround the disputes. So in the end I say you, you want to think about the law compliance problem structure, which gets at the remedies, gets at the interests, and it's some combination of the remedies and the interests and how they vary that you're going to start to see when politics becomes controversial and not. Which is, though, also to say it doesn't come down to the design of the court. It doesn't come down to the court losing. So I think it's always important to remember what's not the answer. Um, because those have important, really practical lessons for judges. It's, the answer for judges is not side all the time with the government or figure out what the government really wants. That's also not the answer that they have to hear. So it's important to figure out the contours of what's going on. So please join me in thanking Professor Alter. And if you're interested in purchasing a copy of her book, it should be on sale outside. Thank you for coming.